the day after, Kerry concedes. And I wish that things had turned out a little differently. The president declares victory. We had a long night and a great night. And outlines a vision for his second term. The party, another defeat for the Democrats. What went wrong? Where do they go from here? The court, new justices on the U.S. Supreme Court, all likely prospect soon what that could mean for issues such as abortion and religion in schools. And divided we stand. The election is over, but on Main Street, in many ways, it is not yet a time for healing. This is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Reporting tonight from NBC News election headquarters on Democracy Plaza. Good evening. After a long and contentious night, President George W. Bush today declared victory and John Kerry conceded. And these two men who represented such starkly different agendas for America finally found some common ground. They agreed the deep divisions in this country must be healed, that the healing must begin. Those divisions can be seen in the contrasting shades of red and blue on the electoral map, but the divisions go well beyond geography. That map has so far added up to 274 electoral votes for the president. That's four more than he needs to be reelected. His popular vote was even more impressive. A three and a half million vote lead over Senator Kerry. That's the most votes ever received by a presidential candidate in this country. It has been a tense and emotional 24 hours to close out a long and heated campaign. We're covering all the angles tonight, and we're going to begin with NBC David Gregory with the winner. David. And Tom, tonight the president says he is eager to launch a second term with a big agenda, from costly Social Security reform to permanent tax cuts to winning the war on terror. After that long night you described, he gathered his inner aides, his, rather his inner circle, in the Oval Office and said to them simply, quote, we did it, team. With all the pageantry of the office he has now retained, Mr. Bush emerged late today to claim a resounding victory. America has spoken, and I'm humbled by the trust and the confidence of my fellow citizens. But even amid the celebration, the president acknowledged deep division in the country and spoke directly to those Americans who voted against him. To make this nation stronger and better, I will need your support, and I will work to earn it. The president's triumphant moment came just four hours after Senator Kerry called to concede. It was 11.02 a.m. Mr. Bush, in the Oval Office, praised Kerry for running a tough campaign. You were an admirable and worthy opponent, he said. But just 24 hours earlier, during a final campaign lap through Ohio, victory was far from certain. 1.51 p.m. Tuesday, as Air Force One touches down at Andrews Air Force Base, the president first learns of network exit polls showing Kerry ahead throughout the battleground. Dejected, Mr. Bush tells his confidant, Karen Hughes, the numbers are what they are. I'm surprised. As the campaign war room kicked into high gear, the president's strategist struggled to contain widespread fears of defeat, arguing the early polls don't reflect heavy Republican turnout. By 9.30 p.m., as the president watches returns with family members, a dramatic turnaround is underway. Florida is solidly Bush. And at 12.59 a.m., the other prize appears certain. This race is all but over. President Bush is our projected winner in the state of Ohio. But Kerry will not concede the election's biggest battleground, insisting on a complete count. And at the White House, frustration mounts. I've spoken to a senior campaign uh, advisor via email who describes this appeal or challenge as, quote, delusional and unrealistic. 5 a.m., still short of the required 270 electoral votes and with no concession. Mr. Bush goes to sleep. Victory would have to wait. But today, a top campaign strategist noted with some relish that unlike four years ago, last night the president became the first presidential candidate since 1988 to win more than 50 percent of the popular vote. Tom. Thanks very much, NBC's David Gregory on tape and at the White House live. In the end, the Ohio's numbers game was a losing proposition for the Kerry campaign. Let's take a look now at the final numbers in Ohio, a margin of victory of more than 136,000 votes for the president. 
NBC's Kelly O'Donnell has been with the Kerry campaign 24-7 on the long road across the fall and across the nation. She was there again this morning when the senator knew that this fight was over. Kelly? Good evening, Tom. John Kerry's concession ended a dramatic 24 hours for his campaign. At first, around dinner time, aides had told him that the exit poll suggested he could win, only to see that vanish late into the night. Until early this morning, Kerry himself determined that a last-ditch legal fight could not give him the White House. John Kerry chose Boston's Faneuil Hall to end his campaign. I'm sorry that we got here a little bit late and a little bit short. Completing the toughest election ritual, Kerry called the president late this morning. And we talked about the danger of division in our country and the need, the desperate need, for unity, for finding the common ground, coming together. Today, I hope that we can begin the healing. Seemingly moved by today's applause and good wishes, Kerry did not expect to be here. At 8 last night, aides told him the exit polls looked good. Kerry waited at home as close friends say he believed he could win, but the numbers shifted and John Edwards was dispatched to tell supporters to hold on. Ohio kept them up all night. Aides say lawyers had legal challenges ready to go, but by 10 this morning they realized the provisional Ohio ballots left to be counted could not overcome the president's lead. The candidate, who was often described as unable to connect to voters, finally revealed emotion in defeat. I wish that I could just wrap you up in my arms and embrace each and every one of you individually all across this nation. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Attempting to blunt not only his disappointment, but the blow to supporters, Kerry offered encouragement. Don't lose faith. What you did made a difference. Perhaps his last appeal of this campaign, Kerry urged Americans to find a softer voice to debate all that divides the nation. I hope President Bush will advance those values in the coming years. I pledge to do my part to try to bridge the partisan divide. I know this is a difficult time for my supporters, but I ask them, all of you, to join me in doing that. On what happened, Kerry's campaign manager says that she will go over all of the raw voting data to find out who actually voted and says that their exit polling was simply wrong. At this point, they also say that the Kerry campaign built a good organization and learned how to use the Internet in ways that might help future Democrats. As for Senator Kerry himself, he goes back to his day job, returning to his fourth term in the U.S. Senate. Tom? Thanks very much, NBC's Kelly O'Donnell tonight with the Kerry campaign. Joining me once again after a long night and a long day, and a long morning. NBC's Washington Bureau Chief, moderator of Meet the Press, my colleague Tim Russert. Tim, um, I remember when Ann Richards was defeated by George Bush for governor of Texas. She said later he is a real political animal and he listens to everything that Karl Rove tells him. That might have been the secret to the success of this campaign. Tom, stay on message. Uh, one a political operative said to me today, whenever you turned on the, the television, morning, noon, whenever, you would see George Bush saying, it's not the government's money, it's your money. Iraq, I was right then, I'm right now. Whether you agree with him or not, the consistency of the message went over, repeated over and over again. And number two, he was always described as a man who said what he meant, meant what he said, and he was a man of faith. I think Democrats vastly underestimated President Bush's bond with his base in a very fervent way. And so when John Kerry would say, this is the most important election of our lifetime, the Democrats heard him, but so did George Bush's base. And they showed up at the polls with an urgency and a passion I've never seen before. And there is that comfort factor. People think that he's a regular guy and they're at ease with him. Particularly in those so-called red states. They can see him in his, with his jeans and his swagger and his belt buckle. A lot of things that a lot of people in the Northeast would laugh at, but they identify with it. And Tom, they will say that their, their connection with him on the issue of values and as a man of faith was much more important to them than the state of the economy or the war in Iraq. All right, thanks very much, NBC's Tim Russer. We've seen enough of each other for the last 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you again. You're the best. Right. Uh, for more now on the why and how of the president's victory, 
We're going to turn again to NBC's Brian Williams, my colleague from last night, with a last look at the exit polling. Brian, what do you have for us tonight? Well, Tom, we have real numbers that explain what happened last night. They answer questions like, what did the president do right? What did John Kerry do wrong? And one issue just about everybody got wrong. For starters, let's take it on the youth vote. So much was said and written about those 18 to 29-year-olds finally coming out in big numbers this year after so many new registrations. Well, the answer is in. The truth is, they didn't. The youth vote made up 17% of the vote nationwide last night. Back in the 2000 election, the Gore race, it was 17%. It hasn't moved off the dime. The next big issue in this country, exit pollsters heard it loud and clear yesterday, moral values. That's what they call it. It means everything from gay marriage to those sexual dysfunction product ads that come on during the dinner hour to an off-color Super Bowl halftime show. What some see as a pervasive culture and climate being pushed at them in the U.S. Well, 22 percent of Americans voting yesterday listed moral values as their top issue over the war, over the economy. Of those voters, 80 percent of them went for Bush, only 18 percent for Kerry. There was no real change in the black vote, but an appreciable 7 percent change in the Hispanic vote, that in Bush's favor. And there is proof in our exit polls that the president linked in the voters' minds the Iraq war with the overall war on terrorism. 55% of voters say they are pieces of the same thing. 42% said Iraq was separate from the war on terror. Finally, something David Gre Gregory mentioned, the exit polls themselves have been a dynamic in this race. These polls are paid for by a consortium of major news organizations, NBC News included. The very first sketchy figures from the field in the mid-afternoon election day, they're called the first wave numbers, and they are just that. They're an early incomplete snapshot that favors some voting groups over others. Well, yesterday, some of the early numbers were way up for Kerry. The early numbers were leaked to so many websites and bloggers and friends and family yesterday. It caused celebration among Kerry forces, panic and then disbelief on the president's team. It even caused the markets on Wall Street to drop sharply, briefly. The major media outlets may have hinted early on in the evening at a good night for Kerry on the way, though some on the web just out and out proclaimed it. Of course, it all turned out to be wrong. The real numbers, the full sample from the field, came in, as always, later in the day. Those numbers ended up matching the vote tallies. So, Tom, a long night that turned into today. All right, thanks very much, NBC's Brian Williams tonight. Up next, NBC News In Depth tonight. What's next for the Democratic Party and what goes on with the House of Representatives and the United States Senate? More Republicans, Tom Daschle, staying home. Richard Gephardt, no longer there. Election 2004 returned the president to office, and most of the Congress will be going back as well, with a few notable exceptions. Republicans picked up Senate seats in six states, including South Dakota, where Minority Leader Tom Daschle lost his race against Republican John Thune. Democrats picked up seats in two states, Colorado and Illinois, where newcomer Barack Obama, who wowed the Democratic convention, won by a huge margin. So with the GOP net pickup of four seats, it will now have a 55 Senate seat to the Democrats' 44. There is one independent. On the House side, the GOP widened its majority, 234 Republicans to 200 Democrats and one independent. All of this leads the Democrats doing a lot of soul searching today. NBC's Andrea Mitchell has more on what's next for the party that has taken another beating on the electoral map. Democratic candidates can dress up to look like they belong in the red states. Did you hit any? But they risk being ridiculed and looking phony to voters. I think they probably think that he looks silly out there, you know, killing the goose. That tank ride by Michael Dukakis in 1988 was just one example of the lengths Democrats will go to connect with middle America. Increasingly, critics say rural voters see Democrats as too smug, too urban, too elite. They're writing off rural America, it seems like, writing off southern America. Even though George Bush has blue blood, he seems to fit right in. Gentlemen, start your engines. Before the Reagan landslide in 1980, Reagan. Democrats controlled the House of Representatives, the Senate, and a majority of the nation's governors. But they've been losing power steadily ever since. As a result of yesterday's election, Democrats will be an even smaller minority in both houses of Congress and hold only 22 state houses. 
largely because many voters say Democrats don't understand their moral values. Even some Democrats say it boils down to guns, God and gays. Issues of faith and culture especially important in the Midwest and South. As I read the Democratic Party today, there really isn't any effective conservative wing left in the party. Except for John Kennedy, for nearly 50 years, only Southern Democrats have been able to bridge this cultural divide and win the White House. Howard Dean, a Vermont liberal, even tried to appeal to Southern whites by saying he wanted to be the candidate, quote, for guys with Confederate flags in their pickup trucks. Folks, now the party faces an identity crisis. Should it move toward liberals like to Dean and Hillary Clinton, or try to appeal to red states by leaning more to the right? Andrea Mitchell, NBC News, New York. And up next, as our election coverage continues, the president may soon have a hot issue on his hands, the future of the U.S. Supreme Court. Absent from the U.S. Supreme Court today, Chief Justice Rehnquist, who is undergoing treatment for thyroid cancer. The Chief Justice uh, is uh, raising a lot of questions with his illness. It's one reason that in his second term in office, President Bush will probably have the opportunity to appoint new justices to the U.S. Supreme Court the first changes in that high court in more than 10 years. What might the Bush appointments mean for the court and for some of the most emotional issues before this country? We get that story tonight from NBC's Pete Williams. Conservatives are hoping President Bush can use the momentum of his victory to shift the U.S. Supreme Court to the right, with possibly two, maybe even three vacancies during the next four years, to be replaced by a president who says he'd favor someone like the two most conservative justices, Scalia and Thomas. And I will continue to appoint federal judges who know the difference between personal opinion and the strict interpretation of the law. The immediate concern, the future of Chief Justice Rehnquist. All signs indicate his thyroid cancer is the most serious form, a typically fast-spreading and debilitating disease. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. If he steps down, the president could bring in an outsider to become chief or promote one of the current justices who would still require Senate confirmation for it. But even if the president appoints more than one new justice, some legal scholars believe Senate Democrats would block nominees considered too conservative. The effect will be to drive the justices who get on the court more or less towards the middle or towards where the court now is. So I wouldn't expect dramatic changes over the next few years. Still, a court with new Bush appointees would be less likely to expand gay rights or uphold affirmative action in school admissions. I pray that you bless both. And more inclined to tolerate religious observances in schools and restrict the growth in federal regulation of the environment. But even conservative legal scholars believe Bush appointments wouldn't necessarily be the end of Roe v. Wade, the law of the land now, for 31 years. More likely, say, abortion opponents are rulings upholding further restrictions, not an all-out ban. I think that the Supreme Court of the United States, appointed by uh, President Bush, would be inclined to uh, support the ban on partial birth abortion. In fact, I don't think there'd be much doubt about that. Even with the new Republican strength in the Senate, both sides predict intense confirmation battles when it comes time for the first new justices in more than a decade. Pete Williams, NBC News at the Supreme Court. And when we come back, neighbor versus neighbor, the day after, the night before. Sunday, the chase. President Bush and Senator Kerry today talked about putting this country back together again as the divisions were once again deep and long across the political landscape. As NBC's Bob Fall learned, that's easier said than done, and the campaigns themselves are often the chief reason for that divide. The day after, Main Street tried to digest the election results, if not bury the hatchet. When it comes to a sense of community and civility, it's pretty much all gone nowadays. In Dairyland, Marathon County, Wisconsin, which Mr. Bush barely won four years ago at for NBC News, Wausau, Wisconsin. Our special post-election edition of Nightly News continues after a break on most of these NBC stations. For the others, we'll see you back here tomorrow night. Back in a moment. Nightly News is a presentation of NBC News. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. From NBC News Election Headquarters on Democracy Plaza, 
This special edition of NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw continues. Today, the final speeches of this campaign, a bittersweet moment for Senator Kerry as he conceded with an appeal for a healing of political wounds and a gracious response from the president as he acknowledged his victory and began to talk about his hopes for a second term tonight. These two candidates, one more time, in their own words. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the president of the United States. Thank you all. You just have no idea how warming and how generous uh, that welcome is, your love is, your affection, and I'm gratified by it. We had a long night and a great night. The voters turned out in record numbers and delivered an historic victory. I'm sorry that we got here a little bit late and a little bit short. <laughs> Earlier today, Senator Kerry called with his congratulations. We had a really good phone call. We had a good conversation. And we talked about the danger of division in our country and the need, the desperate need, for unity, for finding the common ground, coming together. He was very gracious. Senator Kerry waged a spirited campaign and he and his supporters can be proud of their efforts. In America, it is vital that every vote count and that every vote be counted. But the outcome should be decided by voters, not a protracted legal process. I would not give up this fight if there was a chance that we would prevail. America has spoken. And I'm humbled by the trust and the confidence of my fellow citizens. With that trust comes a duty to serve all Americans. And I will do my best to fulfill that duty every day as your president. It was a privilege and a gift to spend two years traveling this country, coming to know so many of you. I wish that I could just wrap you up in my arms and embrace each and every one of you individually all across this nation. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Because we have done the hard work, we are entering a season of hope. We will continue our economic progress. We will reform our outdated tax code. We will strengthen the Social Security for the next generation. I've heard your stories. I know your struggles. I know your hopes. They are part of me now. And I will never forget you, and I'll never stop fighting for you. We'll help the emerging um, democracies of Iraq and Afghanistan so they can grow in strength and defend their freedom. And then our servicemen and women will come home with the honor they have earned. Now more than ever with our soldiers in harm's way, we must stand together and succeed in Iraq and win the war on terror. I will also do everything in my power to ensure that my party, a proud democratic party, stands true to our best hopes and ideals. I believe that what we started in this campaign will not end here. So today I want to speak to every person who voted for my opponent. To make this nation stronger and better, I will need your support, and I will work to earn it. I will do all I can do to deserve your trust. A new term is a new opportunity to reach out to the whole nation. We have one country one Constitution, and one future that binds us. And when we come together and work together, there is no limit to the greatness of America. So with a grateful heart, I leave this campaign with a prayer 
that has even greater meaning to me now that I've come to know our vast country so much better. The campaign has ended, and the United States of America goes forward with confidence and faith. And that prayer is very simple. God bless America. Thank you. God bless you, and may God bless America. Now we're going to take a closer look at the state that wound up as the cliffhanger this year and the linchpin to this election. That's the state of Ohio. Quick look now at the final numbers in Ohio. President Bush won by more than 136,000 votes. NBC's Ann Thompson joins me once again from Columbus with a post-game analysis there. Ann? Tom, Ohio was not just a battleground state. It proved to be the key to the next four years at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The political division and determination of Ohioans made banner headlines across the country. Five and a half million people casting ballots, a new record, in many instances enduring record-setting waits. We've had people waiting nine hours in line. Yeah! At Kenyon College outside Columbus, it was 11 p.m. when some students finally voted, including Maggie Hill. I'm so glad I stuck it out, and I know my classmates are as well. And though there was confusion and frustration, there was also pride in the fact Ohio did not become the Florida of 2004. Elections are human enterprises. And you're going to have a hiccup here or a hiccup there. What you manage against is chronic choking in the system. The president visited this state 52 times, engaging in a brutal air and ground war for its 20 electoral votes. Blue-leaning voters in its industrial north, red-leaning voters in its rural south. An economy shedding jobs and moral values were the most important issues to voters. I think in Ohio and across the country, um, those people who thought the cultural values mattered really swung towards the Republican Party. And political analysts say that's what made the difference in this bitterly fought contest, a contest Ohioans of both parties are relieved because it produced a clear winner. Tom? Thanks very much, NBC's Ann Thompson tonight in Ohio. Now to making your vote count, as Ann Thompson reported, long lines made for frustrating days for many voters, but perhaps the biggest story of the election day problems were the ones that didn't happen. I'm joined now by NBC's Chip Reed, who's been on station at the Making Your Vote Count Center here in Democracy Plaza. Chip, what do you have for us tonight? Well, Tom, many Americans feared the worst about this election because they remember so vividly what happened in Florida four years ago. And there were problems in this election, but for the most part, things went surprisingly smoothly. One big worry that never panned out, touchscreen voting machines and all those dire warnings from critics that they would cause election day chaos. While there were scattered problems, most were minor and nothing remotely like the confusion in Florida four years ago with the older punch card machines. Another concern, voting place challenges. Democrats were worried that thousands of Republican poll watchers would aggressively challenge Democratic voters, especially in minority areas, perhaps suppressing the vote. But in the end, there were only isolated incidents. Despite those two bright spots, there were serious problems in this election, too. And there's little doubt that the votes of many Americans did not count. One major difficulty, those long, long lines, especially in battleground states. And there were too many reports to count of people giving up and going home. Another controversial issue, provisional voting. It nearly took this election into extra innings. All in this nation to some degree did listen. Improvements were made, but yesterday's and today's election makes clear that there's a long way to go before every vote counts. Tom. Thanks very much, NBC Chip Reed tonight. We're getting a rare glimpse tonight behind the scenes of the Bush and Kerry campaigns in a special election edition of Newsweek magazine that goes on sale tomorrow. And with a preview of all that now, I'm joined by Newsweek's editor, Mark Whitaker. Mark, let's begin by talking about the Kerry campaign. I, I think by my lights, at least, there was no more devastating line for him than I voted for the $87 billion before I voted against it. How did that come about? Well, the, uh, the Bush campaign had a theory uh, about Kerry that you could bait him. As Ken Melman, the campaign manager, said, uh, if, if we put the rabbit out there, he'll chase it. And he was going down to West Virginia to give a speech before a veterans group. And they put up a local, an ad in the local TV market, um, uh, goading him for his vote against the funding uh, for, for Iraq. 
And uh, then a heckler showed up in the audience and started giving him a hard time about it. Now, we weren't able to, to establish whether that was actually sent, but he was actually sent by the, uh, by the Bush campaign. But after, Which would have been fair game, by right, the way. Yeah, I mean, kind of tradition right. of, of right. somewhat dirty tricks or right. whatever. Um, we know about that. But anyway, um, after about an Four more years. The president says he's got new political capital and he's determined to spend it. 